Hello and welcome to the Lagcast. It is July 19th, 2018, and we've got a nice show for you here today. Thanks for tuning in. Episode 15! Episode 15. Uh, with me, as always, are my co hosts, Sam Richards hey. and Will Henry. Howdy. And so uh, a crazy thing happened this week, and that was that uh, somebody asked Bruce Willis if Die Hard was a Christmas movie, this and is... he said, No, it's a Bruce Willis movie. So disappointing. <laughs> it's because it's clearly a Christmas movie. <laughs> it's so it's yeah, such a Christmas it's definitely movie. Definitely a Christmas movie. There's I, Christmas kills and everything. I wonder if he was, you know, doing a sarcastic bit since he's Bruce Willis and that's his personality in the popular media that he would be like a Bruce Willis I, movie. I really feel like <laughs> Bruce Willis of all people would be the the person in the Die Hard cast to be like, yeah, that's a Christmas movie. Look at all the Christmas stuff going on. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> if uh, if he wants to make it all about himself, then that's uh, that's his business. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he has become known for that role over and over and over. Yeah, there's even a movie. I don't remember which what it was. I watched it many years ago, but it's about some Hollywood agent, and Bruce Willis plays himself in it, and you know he's in a trailer throwing furniture around, screaming at people. <laughs> it's it was pretty right. funny. Like, uh, you know, so, I'd actually say uh, that Die Hard is a Bruce Willis series, but <laughs> Die Hard number one is a Christmas movie. I, I, okay. Get this guy out of here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, what's happening in games this week? All right. So, Octopath Traveler, which I thought was still like a year out from from being released, actually just came out on the 13th. Is it like a download shop game, or can you go buy a physical copy? You can go buy a physical copy, but nin, uh, not, not, Nintendo, Nintendo. Yeah, Nintendo did not uh, <laughs> plan far enough ahead. And uh, com- completely underestimated how popular this game was going to be, and it sold out physical copies uh, so quickly, and uh, the digital sales are just insane. It's wow. like they didn't release actual numbers, but they said you know significant things about it. Oh. All right. And uh, the game itself is, of course, an RPG. Uh, it's from the people uh, behind Bravely Default. So therefore, it's the people behind Final Fantasy. Well, the team that made Bravely Default, I don't believe, is the team that makes Final Fantasy. No, but I think they have a lot of members who are Final Fantasy yeah, members. Yeah, so, so it's specifically, though, it's the t- same right, team right, that right, made right. Uh, Bravely Default. And I guess this game is supposed... Like, all I really know about it is that it's an RPG, it's a kind of a, like a 2.5D RPG. And uh, I think that you either go down eight paths... Or you play as eight different characters going down those paths. So I don't know if it's like one character going down eight different routes, or if it's eight characters each going down their own route. But the game is supposed to be super customizable with some crazy, uh, super large job system. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the fans, all the critics are just saying that it's fantastic. Nobody has anything bad to say. All right, well, I'll be playing that, I guess. (laughs) I guess I'm playing a Switch game. Yeah, I know. I I, I gotta get it myself. I love the job system. Yeah. Uh, So, the colon two... Okay, so the colon one was a game... It was a battle royale that came out, like, a month after PUBG. So they pushed it out super quick. Uh But a lot of people really enjoyed it, because I guess it was a little more melee-based, even though it was a shooter still. Like, there's a lot more melee combat. Running around whacking people. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So... So just uh, eight days ago, uh, The Calling 2 was released on Steam. And apparently the game is so bad that the developer decided to just delete it and refund everybody and then make the first game free as an apology. The first game free. Comple- yeah, completely free. So wow. it's like anybody can have it now. And I'm just like, there's a part of me which is like, good on the developer, but there's a part of me that's like, how did you... How did you release this? Yeah, did um, <laughs> do we have any reports from anybody who played it in pre-release or anybody who played oh. it before they pulled it? Uh, yeah, I actually read some reviews and uh, one of them was like, the quote, it's a, uh, you know, Royale mess was the line they <laughs> used. And it's like, there's nothing good to say about this game, apparently. Like buggy or just bad? Buggy and bad. Apparently everything oh, that made no. the calling one unique and playable, even though apparently it was still kind of a bad game. Uh, yeah, they just took it out and they made it just another crappy Battle Royale clone, so they made it absolutely pointless to play, and then it also did not work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, and, uh, last piece of news is, uh, Rainbow Six Siege has introduced a new anti-toxicity, uh, feature 
that is in both the like uh, the typed text and also the voice channels uh-huh. that picks up when people are using like swear words and the such and just automatically bans them on the spot. Ooh, that, I can't see that going wrong in any way. Yeah, yeah, first we make it so the AI bans you, then the AI decides it needs to kill you. Yeah, exactly. It's just a slippery slope. and <laughs> I mean, I cannot see this not being implemented in a dozen more games, which is just going to make online gaming hell. Well, yeah, just don't chat. Yeah, yeah exactly, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Because it's like, why are you playing an online game? Yeah, watch, a, watch as they implement this uh, onto social media as well. Oh, God, I know. <laughs> they, always, they already almost do. Yeah, almost. The second one of the major ones does that, everybody all jump ship for another one. So. It's true, it's true. There is a little bit of a, of a safety uh, net yeah. or a block. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it uh, wasn't big uh, gaming news week, so uh, what have you guys been playing? Well, I uh, played a little more Fallout 4. I think I am done for now. All right. Um, but uh, I did... Play a little bit more of that uh, Nuka World thing, yes. where uh, you know it took over. I basically took over all of the settlements that it's possible to take over, yes. and uh, that's kind of what it came to. There wasn't really a resolution, <laughs> other than that. I guess next would be the only mission that would really resolve anything in the area would be to now kill all of the raiders. But uh, it's too funny to go back to my sanctuary and Preston, the, you know, the leader of the uh, what are they, the Minutemen. Yeah. Is uh, he, he comes up to me and he's so mad all the time. He's like, I know what you've been doing with those raiders out there. <laughs> like, you've only got one choice kill them all. And I always reply, like, Heck no, I'm king of the raiders and we rule this wasteland. <laughs> and uh, then he goes, Oh, you, and walks away and never actually gets aggressive or anything. <laughs> That's garby. <laughs> that uh, really is. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, the only other thing I did was I played a little of the Automatron DLC. That was the last of the DLC with any story content. That's the one with a big robot, right? There's many robots. Because right. the main gist of this DLC is that you can construct a robot machine in your home base, and then you can mix and match all the different parts of all the different robots in the game and create your own Frankenstein robots. Of course. Um, which you can then take out and, uh, you know, as companions on missions to help you out, or you can assign them to jobs in your uh, sanctuary areas yeah. and uh, it's uh, all fun for like 20-25 minutes <laughs> and uh, the story content was uh, not compelling whatsoever so I dipped out of that after <laughs> like two of the radio missions that's unfortunate and yeah then I installed it and uh, installed Shadows of Mordor so we'll talk about that next week hey, that's a good choice yeah but you can tell them that in that game yes oh, yeah. methodical yes I, well I didn't play too much this week but I I played a little bit of ARMS again, and it has been one year and one month since the last time I played ARMS. That long. When I uh, got an arm injury, so I did not want to play ARMS anymore. Right. And I always figured that ARMS may have been slightly involved in the fact that I was playing it a lot and doing a lot of arm exercise. Right. But having going back and playing it now, that is an awkward game. You are... In a weird stance, making incorrect punches, like wrong strength, wrong angle, right. wrong speed. It's just all <laughs> wrong, and it's so awkward. And after playing one match, as I was starting up the second match, I started to feel in my arm in just a really awkward way, and I'm like, wow, Whoa. this game is just destroying me. So this game needs some sort of warning on it, is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> arms. Warning. May destroy arms. <laughs> God damn. Uh, so no more arms, huh? Yeah, no more arms for me. I don't think I will. No, no, ever, hit the gym. I, I don't think I'll take that risk again. Yeah. Even if I, you know, even when I'm fully better. Right. Yeah, why would you? Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, I wonder how many others are out there <laughs> who haven't been hurt, who have been damaged in their arms by arms. Oh, man. <laughs> it's rampant. Damn you, arms! <laughs> it sold a million copies in the first week. That's Ooh. a million injuries. That's two million arms. Damn it. <laughs> why have you taken my arms from me? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah, yeah but right. but that's really all I played this week. It was not a huge uh, gaming week for me. Well, that's. Did you play anything, Sam? Uh, well, I've I've been pl- plodding along in Final Fantasy X, but uh, to be perfectly honest, not too much. I feel like it's been too hot lately. Uh, where we live to uh, really get into video games, just sweating all the time. It makes me hard, hard for me to really get immersed in it. Yeah, and I I also got Kingdoms of Amalar Reckoning. Because I played that many years ago when Xbox 360 first came out, mm-hmm. 
And I remembered it being uh, too much like Fable for me to uh, get into it, because I just keep going, nah, this is just like Fable. Right. But now I've played all the Fables so many times, so I figured I'd uh, give it another uh, whirl. Yeah. But, uh, so far, I've only really gotten past the tutorial stage where you <laughs> yeah. build your character and then you escape from a place. Uh, it's, it's not that engrossing, but uh, it's fun in a cartoony, old-school way. Mm-hmm. It does its job. Yeah. What it was intended to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Yeah. So you are going to continue? Yeah, I think maybe. We'll see. If I don't find something better. Cool, cool. Gotta find something better. <laughs> well, Indeed. we didn't play a lot of video games this week, but we did play a new board game uh, just yesterday, in fact. Uh, Blood Rage. Yeah, and uh, it was very enjoyable. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. I had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, Valhalla Ragnarok. <laughs> Norse. Norse. That's, awesome. Norse. Norse. That's, <laughs> awesome. That's the word. You got monsters on the board. You're pillaging villages and uh, uh, capturing areas no. and fighting it out in head-to-head battles with uh, some of the other players. Yeah, um, I thought the board design was really good having it so that... Uh, it was the Nine Realms. Yeah, so it's the Nine Realms, but then also the fights that go on in the center in um, <laughs> Yggdrasil. Yeah, Yggdrasil. Uh, so Yggdrasil. At, the world everybody tree. can join in on those fights, so you could just have these massive wars, which I think in the future is going to be really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think if you get up to four people, then uh, things could really start getting <laughs> nutty. Yeah. Uh, it's a cool game. I like the fact that it's all about getting, uh, what is it, not, glory. Glory. Not honor. Glory. 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 And uh, th- that's pretty cool because uh, obviously there's so many ways you, one could potentially gain glory. I got 22 glory for having four people dead. Well, four <laughs> people in Valhalla. Yes, yeah. <laughs> technically. Yes, yes. Or if soldiers sacrificed to Ragnarok when it consumes a chunk of the board. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's inter- it does a good job of replicating the idea of Ragnarok by taking place in three distinct cycles that all end with a Ragnarok taking place and everybody being reborn. Yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's very very interesting, very cool. I, I liked how it also excel like the cards that we were getting were like accelerating in strength with each stage. So. Like, we thought the cards were good on the second round. Like, ooh, these decks are nice. Yeah. But then the, the third round came along, and it's like, oh my god, these, these cards. cards. <laughs> now that you really know how to play, these yeah. cards are next level. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Yeah. It's, uh, and the, I want to say that uh, it seems almost like somebody took the uh, combat mechanics from the Game of Thrones board game mm-hmm, and sure. kind of designed a game just around that and getting into that <laughs> part really fast and removing a lot of the. Uh, area strategy from it. You know, there's a little bit of strategy based on how you move on the board, but when it comes down to it, it's mostly just about how fast you can get raw strength into place for a combat or prepare effectively so that if when you are defeated, you uh, gain <laughs> glory because that's the end point of the game because you don't always have to win a fight to gain glory. Yeah, you know? It's like they took the risk out of Game of Thrones. Right. Yeah, so it's a lot of fun. We've only played one round so far, but I imagine we'll play a couple more. And it wasn't least. too long. Yeah, like, now that we know how to play, I'm certain these rounds aren't going to take us that uh, long to play. Yeah, it was short enough to the point where you almost all, uh, immediately want to modify some of the rules to make the game a little bit longer. <laughs> oh, although, maybe as we play more, we're going to find ourselves taking a little more time to make those big decisions, because it does seem like a very strategic game. Yeah, yeah. We did rush through round one last time. <laughs> Capture them all! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. I didn't even know what the goal was. I was just like, I'm going to do stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, like all board games. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's definitely a recommend. And it was actually on the cheap side for the uh, high-end board games. So I want to say it was in the $55-ish. Oh, that's that's really well. reasonable. And considering the amount of miniatures it comes with, I want to say it's like 60 or something like that. Like 10. Yeah, probably not. Uh, yeah, with all the monsters and 10 soldiers <laughs> for each board plus a leader. We got everything back into the box without even struggling. Now, that's always a great sign. He's lying. We struggled. <laughs> <laughs> well, they struggle. Just a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, uh, it was good enough to the point where it made me consider uh, perhaps learning how to paint miniatures, which is one of the nerdiest pursuits on the planet that I have not delved into in the past. <laughs> yeah, I bet it's really fun. Yeah, yeah I think so. It probably yeah. is. I mean, that artistic talent. <laughs> once you're once you're into the board game miniatures, then you just start ordering straight up miniatures to be like, I want to draw this instead of drawing a picture. Well, that's the thing. If we get into that, then we're going to end up playing Warhammer. 
Oh. And uh, I feel like maybe yeah. that's worth working towards. But you know I how much know, I want to play Warhammer. Like we, can, we can, <laughs> I would be down for Warhammer or just straight up Dungeons and Dragons. Either way, I, I'm down. Uh, uh, an actual RPG. Yeah, yeah, that could be a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, lots of setup. Hey, well, yeah. we we play one round of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and we just take extensive notes, and then we turn that into its own board game, and just transfer it away <laughs> from Dungeons and Dragons, and yeah. then sell it. Well, I do think that if and when we do p- uh, play any kind of RPG of that nature, uh, we should definitely be recording that and yeah, uh, you, yeah doing that for, as a show for our listeners. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I've always thought the idea of making your own board game sounded fun, though. Oh, it sounds so fun, but then you start doing it and you're like, oh, there's so many options and so many things and they all have to work together. So many things you have to think of. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's hard to create anything, really. Yeah, but you work together. Oh, yeah. A couple people, and you can start filling those holes. And, and frankly, you just steal one idea from one board game and six from another, and then you're almost there. <laughs> All right, we're on a tangent here, fellas. Right, so uh, I think we should go ahead and take a break here uh, right. just for a couple of minutes. We'll be so, right back. Yep, 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 yep. Welcome back, and uh, have we got some TV and movie news for you. Oh, no. Uh, So, uh, today was the first day of Comic-Con San Diego, so Mm -hmm. the uh, reveals and trailers and announcements have been streaming out, and we will certainly have more next week, because, you know, we'll be a few days on from the end by then, and all the announcements will have taken place. Uh, but the first one I'm going to talk about is the trailer for the new Titans show. That is the flagship show of the new DC uh, All Access Streaming Network. Flagship show? Flagship show. This is the thing they want you to buy the service based on. They're going to have comics. They're going to have mo- like their movies and shows that are have already been available. But they're doing four shows, I think, for the the service specifically for it. Titans is the first. They're also, I think, doing Swamp Thing. And Doom Patrol, and one other one. But anyway, I, Titans. I have to question their marketing team, because if the goal is to get this to sell their service, why make a trailer that specifically deters anybody from actually <laughs> watching your product? That's what I was wondering after I watched it. Like, what is this mythical demographic mm-hmm. that wants their Titans to be super dark and gritty and violent and dangerous, but also think, fuck Batman? Yeah, like... <laughs> why, why does she shoot six people in the head and then yell, fuck Batman? It definitely <laughs> looks in that trailer like Dick Grayson, the original Robin, created in 1940, uh, one of the greatest comic book characters of all time, with a definite no killing vow because oh, yeah. he's one of the Bat family. Yep. Uh, super looks like he mercs like five or six guys in a couple seconds in that trailer. And I mean, takes a pistol and like John Wick style headshots like five of these guys. Mm-hmm. Yep. And whoa. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, just based on that, I can't watch that. That's how I was feeling, too. And then just from beginning to end, they're, they're showing Raven, and I'm just like, that's not Raven. That's, that's so not Raven. <laughs> that's so <laughs> not Raven. So not Raven. <laughs> that's what this episode is called. <laughs> yeah, the trailer really seemed like it was trying to feature Raven. Yes. But it just seems like they've made her into such a sad sack. Well, I think that one of the most famous storylines in Titans history is mm-hmm. the one where they all kind of come together for the first time and fight uh, Raven's father, Tri. Gone. And I believe that that's what the show is going to be focusing on as well. That, that sort of adaptation of that storyline. But but whoa, yeah. I remember that storyline from the old cartoon. That, one, that, that was a good one. Yeah. And and they didn't have to change Raven's personality at all in order to pull it off in the show. <laughs> Why are you making a Titans show? I mean, yeah, it's Titans and not Teen Titans, but it's yeah. the Teen Titans and yeah. it's TVMA. Like, what are what are we doing here? <laughs> it, it, it's really really odd. I mean, what age? Are the people who watch the old, good Cartoon Network Teen Titans show, like, are they all just now at the age where they're going to go and watch this in the hopes that it's how they remember that as a kid? No chance. No chance, chance, right? Yeah, this is, I guess, for all the people who thought that the DC Universe movies weren't dark enough. (laughs) It's weird. Like, DC just sometimes seems like they don't know what they're doing. I mean... Sometimes it feels like they don't know what they're doing, and sometimes it feels like they know what they're doing, and they have no idea how to treat their own properties. They <laughs> like all the wrong things, they take all the wrong lessons, and they try to please the wrong fans. Unfortunately. Yeah. That's, uh, that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Moving on. Indeed. Max, would you get this one? Uh, so Netflix, uh, we've known about the partnership with Mark Miller for a while, yep. and uh, they announced the other day uh, that they are adapting five of his comics into uh, TV and movies. Uh, we are getting movies based on Empress, 
uh, which is written by him and drawn by Greg Capullo, which uh, I have read and is quite good. All right. Um, Huck, which is, uh, gosh, I don't remember the artist on Huck, but it's interesting. It's basically a, a short that's sort of like a Clark Kent thing. It's just a dude who's super strong who lives in a small town and tries to do things to help out people in the small town without uh, being noticed and then he's noticed and accidentally becomes a celebrity okay uh, so that should be an interesting little down home slice of life superhero movie yeah. uh sharky the bounty hunter which i had never heard of and still don't know what that is um so i believe that i read that it was uh written by mark miller but never actually released so they have taken some old non-released work interesting yeah uh, and then we're going to get TV shows based on American Jesus, which I've not read, and Jupiter's Legacy, which I have read, and one of you guys read. I read that. Though. Yeah. Uh, that uh, TV show based on Jupiter's Legacy, that's like Game of Thrones, but with superheroes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That could be really good. That could be very, very cool. And we'll have to yeah. see uh, how they replicate some of the scenes that are so iconic in the comic, but are designed in such a way that they can only be done in a comic. Uh, you know, with like the famous uh, mental prison scene from the first issue that Frank quietly uh, drew by uh, illustrating the various stages of comic book drawing production. Mm-hmm. That's a weird piece of art. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, very much looking forward to that. Uh, uh, let's yeah. see. Uh, so Comcast has officially dropped their bid to purchase the Fox Entertainment assets, yeah. and uh, that means that Disney has uh, no roadblocks ahead. And well... Okay, so at the end of June, the Department of Justice approved this deal, right? But then a couple days later, an investigation started internally in the Department of Justice to investigate if this deal was brokered through back channels. Oh, interesting. So it may be possible that this isn't happening, although that news is very much like being buried, so it's also mm. possible that's just like a small investigation that doesn't really matter. Ooh, they didn't grease the right palms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but very interesting. Um, the only other piece of news slash announcement was one of the other announcements from Comic-Con, which is that uh, we're f- we finally got, I guess, the release date of the three Jokers story that Jeff Johns has been promising us for the last <laughs> couple of years. Uh, we got a piece of art uh, that I guess is going to be a cover that uh, has the three Jokers on it. Mm. And uh, so we're going to have to see if that's any good or some sort of dumpster fire. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Anyway, wait, what what do you mean by three jokers? Well, (laughs) in Justice League, I want to say two or three years ago, Mm -hmm. uh, they were doing this event called Dark Side War. Uh, During the Dark Side War, Batman uh, got the chair of Mobius of the New Gods. Or, I'm sorry, Metron of the New Gods. It's the Mobius chair. Uh, And uh, the chair is like the most powerful supercomputer of all time. And uh, it knows the answers to everything. So uh, Batman tests it first by asking it who killed his parents. And it knows. Uh, and uh, so the second thing he asks him is what's the Joker's true identity and it doesn't tell us the reader but we see Batman go no that's not possible (laughs) and then uh, later in another issue I think it might have been the DC Rebirth one shot uh, we got the revelation that Batman uh, had been told by the Mobius chair that there were in fact three Jokers not just one Uh, and that is where we left it Oh, wow. <laughs> Several years ago. Interesting. <laughs> Joker has definitely appeared in many comics since then. A lot of different looking Jokers. I mean, heck, we saw Joker die in Tom King's Batman uh, in issue 49 for all we know. Like, it super looked like he died. Uh, so <laughs> He is immortal. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of a thing that was a bit of a Scott Snyder plot during his run when he tried to, the Joker tried to convince Batman that he was immortal I, by messing with, like, town records and stuff. I right. feel like I've read something where like it, a jo- the Joker or a Joker like character is killed, and then someone else in the town just automatically like, starts to transform because yeah. there must always be one. Well, that was kind of that was kind of the Batman who laughs. Okay, where Batman killed the Joker, and then the dust came out of the Joker and went into Batman. It was That's like, oh, true. actually, that is true. That <laughs> yeah. is very true. And or that uh, Batman Beyond movie where Dick Grayson, uh, it's a uh, Tim, isn't it? Tim Drake. Oh yeah, Tim Drake uh, becomes the Joker because the Joker infects him and. The even though the Joker's dead, he still gets triggered and becomes the new Joker. That might actually be the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely possible. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Anyway, what do yeah. you say we uh, talk about some stuff we watched, Sam? 
Yeah, Sam. <laughs> I'm the only one who watched anything. Well, I kind of watched something. Yeah, and I, and I, I definitely watched Fringe with you, so I mean... That, that, that's true. But <laughs> I've before seen Fringe. I talk about Fringe, <laughs> uh, it's funny, earlier we were talking about Die Hard. Uh, you know who's in Die Hard? Alan Rickman. Yeah. And he's really good. You know what else he's in? A movie that I watched this weekend? Galaxy Quest. Uh, that yeah. a <laughs> hell of a good movie right there. He got there. there. He did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Die Hard. Or, I'm sorry, Galaxy, yeah, Galaxy, Galaxy Quest. Quest. Die Hard, you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Galaxy Quest. The uh, Star Trek parody with Tim <laughs> Allen and uh, Alan Rickman, Sigourney Weaver, a uh, bunch of other guys, Tony, Tony Shalhoub. Yeah, uh, does an excellent job. They're all huge. Uh, yeah, what's his name? <laughs> Justin, whatever, who's in some of the Seth Rogen movies as the kid. Uh, Justin Long. Justin yep. Long, there we go. Um, <laughs> Which is just weird. Just, it feels like he shouldn't have been old enough to even exist. Uh, it was probably one of his really early roles. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what's his name? Uh, as Guy. Oh, I always forget his Sam name. Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell. Oh, yeah. man. The comedy really is so funny. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, uh, the cast is one of the finest casts, like, in any movie ever, yeah, when it no, comes down to it. it it's true, and uh, just the movie itself is so funny. Yeah, wall to wall. There's no drag at all. Yeah, and uh, it's fun. I've heard from many people who've never watched a lick of Star Trek, they never watched, like, they don't like sci-fi at all, but they like Galaxy Quest. So, yeah, it's just a perfect movie. If you haven't seen it, Check what, are you it out. what are you even doing? Yeah, yeah. Where, where have you been? There's no way you're listening to this podcast and you've not watched Galaxy Quest. You, you must finish this podcast and then go listen to it right away. Yeah. Or watch it right away. Yeah. Go watch <laughs> Galaxy Quest right after this. It's worth it. I got up at 5 a.m. and watched it over the weekend. Totally worth it. And I woke up at, like, in the middle of the night and I got up and I was like, Sam's watching Galaxy Quest at <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, nah, that it's just so good. Yeah. Yeah. Like really, never about seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, but but Fringe, Fringe, Fringe. Yes, I watched all of season three and season four over the last week. It's a lot of Fringe. It's a lot of Fringe, but so worth it. Mm-hmm. It gets dull sometimes. <laughs> it, it it happens. There's a there's a couple of episodes where in the middle. It, it, it just it dra- drags a little, okay. and, but I forgive it for that <laughs> because it's for, because of that that I was able to watch this time and realize that there were things that I'd never seen before. There we go. <laughs> uh, that's what I wanted last yeah, week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, and just little things though, like uh, at the end of season four, which I was watching last night. I never knew how Walter got on uh, William Bell's arc in the first place. Um, I knew, I knew that happened, and I knew that arc was uh, between worlds as the worlds collapsed, uh-huh. because the whole plot of season four is that uh, the timelines have been rewritten, and William Bell has been working in the shadows the whole time through almost every fringe event that's gone on in the season in order to activate Olivia and get her into the right place to destroy the world. So by the end of it, she uh, legitimately has superpowers, which right. is uh, pretty cool. Who plays William Bell again? That would be Leonard Nimoy. There we go. <laughs> uh, I knew it was somebody big. I yeah, did not remember. He does such a good job, and it's <laughs> so unexpected for him to come in and be the bad guy of that season after being a good guy in other seasons. Right, right. Yeah, when, so that's a lot of fun. I had only seen him as a good guy previously, and when the bad version showed up, I'm like, yeah, just a couple of tweaks, and he's suddenly so evil. Yeah. <laughs> and once again, like everything in Fringe, it all comes back to Walter. This is a world where Walter was bitter about losing uh, his son's life, and then going over to save the other Peter, and, lose, and, and that Peter dies in the frozen lake. Uh, where they were originally saved by the Observer. Right. <clears throat> right. So, in his bitterness, uh, working with William Bell afterwards, uh, he said some things that got into William Bell's head that this is an imperfect world, and they have the power, the scientific knowledge, to make a new world however they want. And, yeah, it, just, it all culminates on that boat with everything has been set up, and there's nothing that William can do to stop it, and he's there with Walter, ready to give birth to a a new world, and then they'll die out, but there will be a a new race of beings to take over, Uh 
Right, the new race. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so Walter, while, while they're having this conversation, is just uh, like grabbing a gun, loading a gun, like he's going to shoot William Bell. And William Bell, he, he doesn't care. He's he's done with his plan. If he dies, it doesn't matter. It's just people used earlier. Right. Because uh, that's how you know it's a bad plan. It doesn't matter if the person orchestrating it lives or dies. That means there's a good plan. plan. And you're crazy. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, some, if some crazy dictator is like, ah, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn the world because once I'm done, it doesn't matter if I'm alive as long as the world burns. Yeah, but it's not burning. <laughs> I'm going to burn this world to make a beautiful new world. That's even scarier. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, not, I'm not saying, saying <laughs> a, a, a scary dude. Yeah, I didn't mean good like in the moral good. I just meant good in that in effective. Okay, fair. Fair. Oh, fair. Yeah. fair. <laughs> oh yeah. But then, in, in the final moments. Walter takes the gun, aims at Olivia real quick, boom, right in the head. Oof. Kills her. Stops everything. Right. William Bell escapes somehow. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's oh. in phase between worlds, so yeah. I, uh, he probably phases into the other world. And then uh, Walter does some uh, quick surgery on the superpower Olivia, and it's a, it's a pretty gruesome surgery scene of him sticking a needle into the back of her head, to create an exit wound so they can stick it in the other side and pop right. the bullet out. To show a heal? So she has a healing factor right. now, <laughs> as well as telekinesis and uh, various other powers. But yeah, just the moment when Walter shoots Olivia in the head to stop it all is uh, powerful. Yeah. No, that's not Yeah. Walter's not supposed to be able to ca- be capable of that. <laughs> <laughs> Might make that the best season of them all. Though season three is also good. It's a it's a lot of fun when it jumps back and forth from episode to episode, uh, alternate universe this universe. So right. you get like episodes that only have the alternate universe cast. It has a different opening, right? A different world, different kind of fringe events, but still a monster or scientist, uh, mad scientist of the week. So if you haven't seen Fringe, I give it a very high recommendation. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah oh, that's Max. all I got. Did you want to talk about anything? No. All right. What do you say we uh, move on to some uh, wonderful, wonderful Star Trek character rankings? Yes. All right. Yes. So as as we do every week, uh, we are going to be adding three more characters to our master list of uh, all the characters in Star Trek. And uh, I, once again, have two themed lists for you guys to choose between. And as always, if you guys choose different uh, lists, I will be the tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first list is a list of Ferengi. The second list is a list of villains. Mm. Villains. Villains. All right, villains it is. So the first villain on my list is Q. Q. Interesting. Now, are we talking about all Q or just QQ? <laughs> uh, only Q, because they're not a hive mind. They are the distinct individuals. They just exist on a higher plane than mm, this is true. normal people. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, we're not talking about the Q who wants to die from Voyager, and we're right. not talking about you know any other Qs. We're we're talking about John Delancey's Q from the first episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation, okay. all the way through Voyager. Yes. Uh, I'm oh, probably okay. the most recurring villain in Trek. I mean, Goldicott might be in more episodes overall <laughs> since Q only shows up for one yeah, at a time. Goldicott, Wayun, Kai Wen all kind of show up more just because Deep Space Nine has a greater focus on the villains. Right. Well, but, I appreciate Q a lot more now. When I was a kid, I did not like Q episodes to the point that it deterred me from watching Next Gen in general. Mm-hmm. I've heard that before, actually. Uh, a lot of people seem to not like Q, which I never got. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't get that. To me, he's always been a, a Loki-type character. He's part of it. Like, that's just a, a part of it to me. Yeah, like, the classic next-gen villain. Right, exactly. He's in the first episode, he's in the last. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, always very well acted, always funny. I don't think there's a Q episode that he doesn't do something at least very entertaining. Right, he sends him to Sherwood Forest, he sends Picard <laughs> back to Picard's past when he loses his heart, which is a fantastic episode. That's a good episode. Picard's history. Uh, Thank you, Q. He visits Cisco, but and Cisco's <laughs> the one who's like has no time for his shit. 
<laughs> yeah, so he never comes back. Right. Which is like, okay, good good job, Cisco. And yeah, because does he show up more than once? Oh, he shows up a couple times in Voyager, right? He, sh- he shows up quite a few times, actually, because he even gets a two-parter where they go to the... The Q Continuum. The Q Continuum. Right, which they show is just like a dusty road <laughs> and like a person sitting on a chair, like right. a pumpkin. <laughs> and and the, the Q uh, Continuum War, which is a, a civil war, so it takes place... Uh, to our humanoid characters of limited mind in a Civil War setting. American Civil War. <laughs> no, American Civil War. <laughs> All right, so, uh, Q, Q, I'm probably looking right around... What about right around Wayoon? We like you more or less than we Shockingly, I was looking at the same area, even though I think I like him less than you guys. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Sam? About I... waiting his flocks and then Martok. Flocks and Martok. Definitely like flocks and Martok more than Q. Okay. I think I like Wayne more than Q as well. Alright, well next down is Janeway. That's a different... They, they are about the same for me. That's interesting. <laughs> I would actually honestly probably put Q below Janeway. I'd put... Because you know what? I would put Q below 7 of 9. Okay, yeah. But what about Archer? I'd put Q below Archer. All right, we're going down the list. Jake Sisko. I'd put Q below Jake Sisko. All right, I'm going to take a couple steps. Tom Paris. I'd put Q above Tom Paris. Shran. I'd put Q above Shran. All right, we're coming on it. Okay. Sulu. I'd put Q above Sulu. Okay, Q goes above Sulu and below Jake Sisko. <laughs> It's an interesting place. It really is. I'm comfortable with that. I was so I was so prepared for you guys to be like higher ten, and I'm gonna be like no. All right. Well, the next one is a villain who only appears on a couple episodes. For some reason, I always thought of him as appearing on more, but uh, yeah, it's only three total, I think. Uh, Oh no, four actually. And that character is Lore. Really. Only four. Well, are we it, counting two parters? Uh, two part with the Borg as two separate episodes. As two separate episodes. I was because wow. it's the one where he shows up, oh. the one where they visit Doctor Stone when he dies, oh. and then that one. Is that the crystalline entity? No, but the crystalline entity shows up in an episode with Outlaw, and that they deal with it, and he's not around. The crystalline oh, entity okay. is the first lore episode. Oh, okay, yeah. got it. Okay, yeah, that, those are the only ones I can remember, yeah. so I guess you're right. <laughs> wow. Anyway, yes, Data's evil twin brother lore. They didn't do the Mirror Universe, but they did do an evil twin, and it was Brent Spiner uh, acting like a net. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if in the Mirror Universe there's a lore, and he's a good guy. I know, right? I don't remember if they mentioned him in the Mirror Universe comic, but... uh, Leave that for another time. I feel like Data in the Mirror Universe would have disassembled him for backup parts, for sure. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. (laughs) Um, Lore's all right. He's uh, he's entertaining whenever he's on screen, for sure. Yeah, yeah, a little overacted on Spiner's part, I would say. But I think that's very much intentional. Like, um, that might be direction. Yeah, and it, well, it could be direction, but it could just be that Spiner's a wacky dude, because yeah. we know he is. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, that episode when Laura shows up and Dr. Swing is dying is essentially Brent Spiner acting against himself as three different characters for a majority <laughs> of that episode. <laughs> it's so true. And that is probably the best Laura episode. Yeah, probably. Because they're just talking. Yeah. The, yeah, and then he steals Data's emotion chip, but everybody wants Data to get the emotion chip, so it's heartbreaking for him to not get the emotion chip. Yes, so. yeah, yeah, it's truly sad. <laughs> um, so, uh, Lore, definitely better than B4. <laughs> B4? In Star Trek Nemesis, when we get the, the Data prototype. Oh! Because Data oh, dies. Right, Nemesis. they do the reset. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, Lore, I'm, uh, I mean, he can't go that high, honestly. No, no, no. Uh, like, down here around, like, Barkley or Guinan or something. Well, I'd put them below both Barkley and Guinan. All right, what about Gowron? Uh, oh, wait, mean, that's even higher. Never yeah. mind. Uh, <laughs> what about Neelix? No, higher than Neelix. Yeah. Okay, Keiko? Higher. Higher. Higher than Keiko. Higher, higher than, than Keiko. wait, higher than Pulaski? 
Who are we? Uh, uh, Lore. 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 <laughs> uh, let's put him right below Pulaski. He's below so for, Pulaski? So forgettable that he goes below Pulaski. Okay. He's not forgettable. Well, at least he's not <laughs> in it enough. I saw this shirt that has both of them on it that says Trust Data, not Lore. It's, data, it's, not Lore. It's genius. <laughs> it is. It's so true. All right, last villain on this villain's list is going to be the Borg slash the Borg Queen. Oh, they are Lord. a hive mind and count as one character. Well, the Borg is awesome. Yeah, Borg <laughs> might be the best villains in Trek. Yeah, they're, they're so they're scary, just, and they're they're done in such a Trek way. Yeah, where sure people have thought about the hive mind, half uh, biological, half mechanical things, but nobody has like made it a, a reality like Star Trek did with the Borg cube. The cube being so different, and the Borgs actions, uh, how they don't uh, worry about you, they don't do anything unless they see you as a threat, you can just walk right by them, no problem. They managed to make it scary that the Borg were going to reach Earth in 60 years. Yeah. 60! <laughs> yeah, yeah, because Q showed them the Borg early, and uh, they were not ready, and they were told they weren't ready, and that's like one of the few fights in Star Trek where the Enterprise is just completely outclassed and never has a chance. Yeah, yeah. and then you get that great speech from Picard, where he's like, you want me to say I need you? Well, Q, I, I need you. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It really is. Yeah. And um, uh, Borg Queen is one of the better villains in Star Trek movies. Uh, I mean, Borg Queen just taking Data and Oof. wanting Data to be the new... The reverse uh, Borg. <laughs> the reverse Borg. God. The new second... Like Locutus, but better. Like Locutus, but better. And I mean, she was a recurring villain on Voyager, and I would say that if Catherine Janeway has an arch nemesis, it's the Borg Queen. Yeah, that's true. If not the Herogen boss. Eh, um, maybe, but... The Herogen were pretty cool. Yeah, the Herogen are, are pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, so where, where, where do we want to put the Borg slash Borg Queen on this list? I think... Pretty high. That they're going to go pretty high. I think that I'm going to start measuring them against Martok. Against Martok. Give me a number. Oh, man. 23. 23. Okay. I... It, it's, it's tough, but I'm actually going to say higher. Higher than Jordy LaForge? Jordy LaForge. Yes, because the Borg adds so much. They're so... They're such a villain. They're just such a villain. What do you think? Borg better than Jordy LaForge? I'm, I'm questioning this. Uh, I mean, the Borg have done quite a lot for Star Trek. But Jordy... But in a lot of ways, Jordy has two. Jordy has two. I think that the argument for placing the Borg lower is the fact that when it comes to Borg, you don't have that much character personality. They're literally Borg. It's They're like... Just right. the queen. I'm, yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm a, a threat that you can't fully understand. Right, exactly. But they're very uh, Geiger-esque. Yeah. Lovecraftian and Geiger-esque at the same time. Uh, fear of the dark type of uh, yeah. alien. The alien of the unknown. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess... I can't do above Jordy. Okay, so, so then in that case... Right below Jordy, right above General Martok of the Klingons... Knock down one more. Dr. Phlox? <laughs> Between Martok and Phlox? I don't mind that. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I was just thinking about it. I feel like Martok just has so much personality. <laughs> I do I do enjoy a good Martok. Yeah. And, I mean, he would be our best representation of Klingon if it weren't for Worf. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, uh, that was three characters. I think that was a pretty good rating, folks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's fun. Thanks, Always guys. Is. Thanks. Uh, right. Let's take a quick break and then come back. We'll yeah. be right back. Hello and welcome back to the Lagcast. And uh, first, we've uh, got a Transformer of the Week for you. Uh, so you grabbed this big red and blue truck. Yeah. Out of the Transformers case. It's, it's very cool looking. It looks like it's got some metal on there. Yeah, yeah. It's got some nice chrome, uh, shiny pieces. It's uh, real heavy. And there's definitely uh, chunks of the chassis that are made out of uh, die-cast metal. Uh, can you guess what character this is just from his vehicle mode? Oh, oh. Uh, it was on the tip of uh, the uh, primal... Jetstream! 
<laughs> ah, so close. Oh, man. Optimus Prime. This, this is a good Optimus Prime. Um, the interesting thing about this one is that it's a... Uh, this is the movie Optimus Prime, where I do put him in robot oh. mode through his very complex transformation. This would be the uh, Michael Bay version. Oh, so um, do you have to, like, take all the pieces out and, uh, like, rotate them and then put them all back together? Yeah, the transformation is actually quite ingenious, making use of several uh, long flaps to hide areas within. And, uh, but it, it looks very accurate in movie robot mode, I must say. Um, this is not an official Transformers product. This is a knockoff toy from a Chinese Ooh. knockoff company that uh, takes uh, <laughs> molds that Hasbro, or uh, Takara in this case, had done and uh, does larger, better versions of them <laughs> with uh, more improved, complex transformations, <laughs> and uh, they add metal pieces and increase the amount of paint detailing and make it a truly what? deluxe level item. How oh, is wow. this a Chinese knockoff company? They do everything the opposite. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, and the funny thing is, you know, it's the if this were an actual masterpiece transformer from Takara, it would probably be in the hundred and fifty to two hundred dollar range. And uh, these guys retail for about ninety nine dollars. Wow! Um, and they are still available. I highly recommend any Transformers enthusiasts to pick up one of these uh, oversized Optimuses. Both the movie version and the same company does a uh, oversized version of the Masterpiece Optimus from uh, Takara, which uh, is quite quite nice. Indeed. Quite nice. Um, so, uh, that is the Transformer of the Week. All right. Uh, that's one that was. Uh, very, very nice. So, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this was the first day of Comic-Con, so we have a couple of uh, comic news things. I don't know why I put the three Jokers news in the TV and movie thing, because that was 100% comic news. Uh, (laughs) Whatever, that's fine. So, three Jokers was announced at Comic-Con, it's comic news. Um, But the most exciting thing announced at Comic-Con is one of the most exciting things that could have been announced at Comic-Con for yours truly, which is that uh, Grant Morrison is back on a DC Monthly Superhero comic for the first time in many years. I don't think he's been on one since uh, when he was on Action Comics during the New 52. Oh, wow. Uh, So he's on Green Lantern uh, with uh, current hot shit illustrator Liam Sharp. Nope. And uh, it's going to be a space cop procedural in the depths (laughs) of the DC Universe. Space areas. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, they've released a few, you know, preview shots of the art, and it looks very clean. So it's definitely going to be readable. The, it definitely <laughs> seems like they're going for a very silver agey vibe with yep. the art, very throwbacky, which definitely. is uh, very good because Morrison is a little bit of a throwbacky writer, yeah. uh, while at the same time being postmodern, which is weird. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, and every time Morrison has written Hal Jordan in the past in like one of his event comics or you know in uh, Justice League or anything. Um, he's always had him be pretty in character. I like his version of Hal, so... He gets it. He, he tends to get characters. That's why I like him. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Marvel... This wasn't a Comic-Con announcement, but Marvel has announced that they're bringing back their classic series, What If?, where they would uh, ask serious questions like, you know, what if Hulk was somebody else? Like, gosh, why can't I remember a classic one? <laughs> but, uh, you, know, you know, what what if Wolverine, somebody else got an animated skeleton? Basically, they mix and match their concepts. What if the Hulk was Wolverine? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, we'll get to that later. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it seems like they're going to be uh, using this to launch some interesting uh, one-shot ideas that they could potentially spin off into other series like Spider Gwen. Um, I don't recall what all the announcements were, but the only one that I that really like piqued my interest was the uh, what if Thor was raised in Jotunheim by uh, the Frost Giants instead of Loki <laughs> oh. being raised in Asgard. So uh, it's a cool cover of Thor chilling with the Frost Giants, but it's, he's blue. Wow. Oh wow! And uh, so that could be interesting. Uh, um, that sounds like it could be fun. Yeah, the others were not uh, interesting I, enough to I, remember. The one I put here, I just thought was ridiculous, which is Peter Parker as the Punisher. Right, what if Peter Parker was the Punisher? <laughs> like, that, is, uh, <laughs> that is the other one I think that people are most interested in. Interest, you know, yes, but Spider-Man. I don't know how I feel. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that could go in a lot of different directions. I mean, when you can snap a guy in half with your hands... It'd be a pretty effective Punisher. It'd probably have to be stopped by uh, another superhero with powers. Yeah, I do wonder if he's going to have the spider powers, or if he's just going to be a spider-themed vigilante. I I don't know. I could not tell. But the costume was definitely (laughs) spider-punisher. Lethal webbing bullets. 
Yeah, I Ooh. think that's what the cover looks like. Oh my god. <laughs> He's shooting people in the face so they can't breathe. Well, we're not seeing anybody <laughs> shooting, but it's like him shooting outwards on the cover with, you know, his hands in web shooting mode, but it's all black and yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's rough. It's bad. Um, <laughs> So the other uh, semi-big news from Marvel is that it was announced that uh, Marvel has partnered with IDW to have IDW uh, produce a series of comics that are going to be aimed at younger readers. Hey, that all sounds good. Uh, to which I um, say this good. is the beginning of the end for Marvel Comics. Oh, no. This is uh, di- <laughs> most likely Disney uh, deciding that Marvel Comics themselves are not able to successfully produce a comic with their own characters that will appeal. Because Spider-Man should be for kids anyway. Like, yeah, right? yeah. That's what Brandon Spider-Man that, is. That's, that's my feeling towards that. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they've got this other comic division agreement with IDW, and they may very well decide to just fold Marvel into, like, a pure entertainment thing and license all the characters to IDW to produce the comics. And oh, yeah, you're right. That does seem like uh, like the business route. I, uh, I am I am afraid, indeed, that this is the beginning of the end for Marvel Comics. Yeah, why segment your demographics if you don't have to? Right, exactly. Having some trouble, Max? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, it's bad. It's bad news, in my opinion. Yeah, no, no, I know. Exactly. It, it seems like Marvel might just be going. Sorry, we're all distracted by pencils right now. <laughs> there just suddenly is an amassment of pencils on this table. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it, guys. <laughs> anyway, what did they announce? An Iron Man and a Black Panther, and there's a Spider-Man one that I think is going to feature Miles Morales. Yeah, I, I didn't. Uh, I just paid attention that Iron Man is coming first in November, and then Black Panther is in January. That's all I I saw. I mean, I hope they're good because I do think that you know getting kids into comics is one of the only way to save it. But now, uh, if they're if they're really good, though, is that good or bad for Marvel? <laughs> it remains to be seen. <laughs> Oh, that's rough. And uh, that's really all we had for our comic news. So uh, shall we move on to the comic review segment? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I, I like reading comics. Yeah, all right. Some uh, digital comics. Uh, yes, as uh, usual, when I have digital, we'll start with that, so we can get it out of the way. Uh, I read the first issue of uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation Terra Incognita, which is the follow-up <laughs> series to the Mirror Broken series, which, as you may recall, ended with uh, all of the Mirror Universe characters escaping back to their dimension, except for Barkley, right. who had locked the regular Universe Reg in his room and was going to. Uh, masquerade as him and uh so the uh story again is by scott and david tipton and uh just like the previous series uh we've switched to uh, art by uh tony chastine uh so it's a more traditional comic book style than the uh more painterly style that the other series were and this issue pretty much just follows mirror barkley as he uh, monologues at the captive coward barkley and then uh, is involved in a minor mission where they uh, go to meet a uh, they, they go to meet Riker and Jordy's old ship because they're having a breakdown with their warp core oh. um, yeah what, what's the ship called yeah. the hood the USS hood <laughs> And uh, as you remember, in the first episode of Next Gen, where Riker and Jordy are coming over from another ship where they had been formerly uh, stationed together. Right, before they go to pick up O'Brien. Right, and the captain of the Hood is the captain that Picard is talking about when he mentions, like, oh, I read the story about him not letting his captain beam down on an away mission, like, even though his captain wanted him to, and I realized that, like, that's the man I wanted, a man who would break an order because he thought it was right. (laughs) Yep. And uh, so they're, they're having trouble with their engines, so the Enterprise sends an engineering team over, uh, which is comprised of uh, Jordy, uh, Barkley, and uh, Sonia Gomez. Ah, uh, Sonia. Uh, famously from the Borg episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, that's true, isn't it? She spills coffee on Picard, doesn't she? Yes, yeah, she's in two episodes, that's one of them. <laughs> Um, I don't know if that means we have to rank her or not. Um, <laughs> it should be mentioned that Guinan instantly realizes that the Barkley that she's talking to in Ten Forward is not Barkley, but she doesn't seem to do anything about it. Yeah, I, I imagine <laughs> Troy would it, be able to figure it out instantly as well. You'd think, but uh, when she, they, she talks to Barkley in this, she's just like, you, you're so much healthier seeming. Because <laughs> Troy is a terrible telepath. Yeah. Empath. Uh, uh, empath, yes. Uh, so, uh, Jordy and Gomez aren't able to easily fix the problem with the Hood's warp core, but, uh, Barkley knows immediately what the problem is because in the Mirror Universe, 
the warp cores were constantly breaking down for all sorts of different things, so he understands all sorts of random ways that the warp core can break down uh, compared to Jordy. He's like, we need to run diagnostics on everything. <laughs> and uh, But because nobody will even let him talk, he has to manufacture a crisis situation where he can be the one to save the day. Uh, of course. Nice. Yeah, which uh, he successfully does, makes himself a little bit of a hero, he gets mad about Jordy and Picard crapping on him, and uh, <laughs> sinisterly locks Reg in the closet now instead of tied up on his bed. <laughs> just in case someone comes into the quarters you know yeah, so we'll see the uh, preview for the next issue suggests that uh, it's going to be a non-Barkley related issue just some other thing they're dealing with so I don't know how much this series is going to focus on Mirror Barkley's exploits in yeah, the regular universe regular Barkley's trapped in the closet for who knows how long <laughs> oh. oh man that cannot be good for his psychosis no <laughs> <laughs> it's no wonder he has it <laughs> yeah man we'll just locked in the closet for days <laughs> that man's gonna yeah that's gonna be bad he's never gonna recover from that yeah uh, so I'm uh, moving on to the what is this the sixth issue of Versus the fifth issue of Versus fifth issue of Versus by Ivan Brandon and Esad Rybic yep. or Rybic who knows yeah so this seems like it's the uh, the ending of what I would say is the first arc it really feels like it as we mentioned last week with Oblivion Song uh, Image tends to uh, collect things into five issue collections so that's what all of the writers tend to write towards in the singles interesting yeah yeah but uh so up until now the comics have been mostly like combat sequences with a little plot weaved between this is the first one that is just plot the whole way through there isn't really a big long battle <laughs> and in photo time it gets confusing oh really like it, i could i could always follow along with what was going on for the most part but i was losing certain things and the comic would fill me in two pages later or whatever on the thing I missed. I'm like, that needs to be represented more clearly so that I'm not losing it rather than being informed later. Right, if you re realized it was such a problem that you're putting in the reminder later, then that means maybe you need to go back and fix the script earlier. Yeah, exactly. And there was also a couple small things that I felt like was just kind of bad writing. And since this is the <laughs> first time that they actually had to write a lot, that kind of concerns me. Right. But at the same time... It, they've set up a pretty interesting plot overall, and uh, they've set up a lot of care, uh, players, essentially, in this plot. Uh, a lot of teams that we know nothing about. Like, there were some hackers at one point that decided to hack the, you know, the game's comm system. And uh, they sent out a message that basically told everyone that the you know, government controlling the game was trying to kill our main character, Santa Flynn, intentionally. Uh -huh. And... They got cut off, but the crowd became outraged, and, you know, we don't know, I don't know who those guys are, they're just clearly supporting our main character, who is, as far as I can tell, like, a good fighter, but it kind of seems like it's a big show, like, he's also kind of an actor, uh -huh. so, uh... Yeah, now they're free. Uh, so out the ship the fan a little bit. The yeah, has expanded. Exactly. They broke out of a literal dome on the planet, so I think they may have thought that was the world. It was. It's very much the beginning of a Final Fantasy, right? They've now yes. finished the first town, <laughs> and now you've got the world map. Exactly, and uh, and yeah, so it it could get good from here. Well, that's the thing. Is this yeah. uh, could be a potential jumping off point? Do yes. you think that we should continue to purchase this? I do. I think that. I'm not entirely satisfied with this first arc, but I think that they have set up a potentially really good story. And it looks amazing. It looks amazing. The art oh, is... Man. I mean, he's just one of the best artists working today, and, in my opinion. And that's why those first four issues that are mostly just big art scenes are acceptable. Because yeah. it's like, you're not giving me too much, but... It looks really nice. Great color work all around. Just a yeah, nice presentation. And I don't think there's any ads in the middle of the book, right? That image usually puts everything in the back. No, it, so. is, it is a nice and clean read. And I, I, I'm always surprised when I'm reading those comics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of image comics, uh, we already have the second issue of Magic Order by Mark Miller and uh, Olivier Coypel. Hey, Mark Miller. Mark Miller. <laughs> I, I, I still can't believe that this isn't one of the shows they announced. Because, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Like, <laughs> that is weird. Because it, it feels like it's kind of written like a show. Very much so. Yeah. I wonder if he was intending to do it that way, and uh, then they were like, eh, let's go with one of these other ones, and we'll save this one for later. I mean, they may just want to get more issues out before they start adapting. 
Hey, I have nothing against that. That's usually a good idea. <laughs> so uh, this was a pretty entertaining issue. A lot more straightforward than the first one because they didn't have to introduce so many characters. Yeah. Even though I still don't really know no, who anybody know is. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Now you kind of have an attachment. This is the same girl who busted out of that limo in the first issue, right? The escape artist. The yes. escapologist. Right. And uh, she's got a creepy origin story about <laughs> transplant. They tried to abort her, so she escaped into the nurse's uh, room and... <laughs> changed the nurse's blood type and the nurse had the baby and the dad who it seemed this is the dad right the same guy the yes. dad who tried to abort her ended up adopting her anyway yes. with yes. a different woman I think so <laughs> yeah because yeah. yeah that's which is hilarious um, all good so that's convoluted and uh yeah, she, reveal of who she's telling this story to <laughs> Oh, yeah, she's on the story to a bunch of little kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, how'd she even get to that party? Right, that's a magician. <laughs> right. True. But, uh, so, we uh, then move to one of the classic uh, scenes in all forms of literature, which is the scene where all the characters sit at a big table and talk about what uh, the story's about. Right. <laughs> the classic trope of uh, walking into the painting. Right, right, he walks into a painting, because he's got to do some magic shit. Yep. Um, so we get a little meeting where we, it's mostly really just so that we can get what everybody's character, like, relationships are with each other. Yeah. Because yeah. no information that we don't know is revealed here. It's just, we're being hunted, we think it's this person, right. here's why it's happening, and uh, here's how we feel about each other. Right, um, they all know each other. And then they get the message <laughs> that one of their, like, magical artifact storage facilities has been broken into, Wha so they go meet a nerd who's, like, the guardian <laughs> of the Why is the comic book, book guy <laughs> guarding all their <laughs> rare expensive I didn't, goods? I didn't realize that, but you're right. This is 100% the comic book guy from The Simpsons, <laughs> and I'm sad I didn't realize that because I would have been reading all the dialogue in that tone of voice. So. Oh, yeah, it looks like we both did. Yeah. The basement of the Android's dungeon right Exactly. <laughs> the bastards took the Horologium. <laughs> yeah. Sounds. Oh, but my God. Uh, yeah, so uh, they've got a weird camera that takes pictures that I guess doom you. A soul camera. A soul camera. Yeah, it looks like it steals your soul. Um, we get uh, the name of the creepy assassin dude, uh, uh, the Venetian. Yes, the Venetian. The Venetian lines. Uh, they murder somebody by filling her taxi with water. Yeah, yeah. and, and she drowns really, really fast. And she drowns really fast. <laughs> she does drown really fast. <laughs> and uh, then, like the next page, they're assassinating this other guy who I'm assuming was at the magical round table. Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know. He who might have been is. sitting there. Yeah, I, I don't think that really matters. We just need to know that this guy can kill people through mirrors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. decapitated them through the mirror. Yeah, this is uh, it's definitely all a lot of like very fast moving introduction. Yeah, and then killing off. I didn't even notice this before. <laughs> yeah, I was reading this at work, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> and <I'm> closed. <laughs> and uh, once this comic they wanted you to know is produced by Netflix. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a Netflix comic. They've been I'm making bad. little trailers for it and animating panels. It's and, amazing. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, so speaking of what if, uh, I continue to buy Weapon H for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, why do you think I continue to buy Weapon H? Uh, because it seems like they might be turning it back onto the right track sometimes, and then the next page or the next panel, they immediately reverse course. Why is the wife appear to be an employee of the company that turned him into a monster? Like... I can't remember everything, if that was set up or not. Everything has wrapped back into this one company that before seems to not even be related to them and was just like, oh, look, there's a monster over there. We should get it. Yeah. Now they made the monster or what is happening? Uh, yeah, there's uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, this is a comic book where things happen. Uh, there's a guy in a suit who doesn't really run, but he kind of wobbles around. That is a horrible drawing. <laughs> Dario Agar can turn into a minotaur, so I don't know why he's running like a little bitch throughout this comic. He's doing it here, too. It's like every time he's just, he cannot run because he's wearing the nice suit. Yeah. He uh, wobbles. We should say that uh, this is written by Greg Pak and uh, drawn by Corey Smith, and he, he draws Weapon H really good. <coughs> yeah. Although it can be hard to follow what's happening. Eh. Eh. Just a little. Just a little. And faces aren't always great. I don't want to knock this guy too much. It's passable comic book art, but yeah. it's not too dynamic. Uh, that this page is, this cool. is the best part of the comic, and this is why you buy the next issue because they keep doing this. It's yeah. like something cool happens. Yeah, the, this comic definitely has the to be continued on lockdown. Okay, I did. Really I, 
I did like when uh, I liked when Man Thing or whatever and the little talky dude were uh, backing him up. I'm like, okay, I'm cool with that. Suddenly, it's a random team up comic. Although I am officially <laughs> over when characters are having team ups in comics and they say we're having a team up. Yes, I, I agree in a super meta way. Like that, that is fair. Yeah, Morrison <laughs> killed it. He killed it in the '90s. <laughs> um, but yeah, it seems like there's some sort of Cthulhu demons coming through some sort of portal that Roxxon opened, and they're like, "Can you go kill these demons, Weapon H?" And Weapon H is like, "I'll try." Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of weird considering just a minute ago these guys were essentially torturing him. Right, and then preview for next issue, uh, it looks like it's Weapon H versus Captain America for some reason. What the so f- I don't know if Captain America is going to be Cthulhu. I didn't even notice. But uh, <laughs> uh, Weapon H. All right, then. Uh, as long as they have it at the store, I will probably buy it, but I probably will not add it to my pull list. It is a comic that we read. <laughs> some of them are just like that. Some of them are just comics you read, you know? Yeah. But some of them are comics that you really enjoy and buy every issue of all the time. Sometimes they're comics you love. Yeah. And uh, a comic I love is East of West by Jonathan Hickman and Nick Dragata. Um we continue to spiral towards the ending of this series. We can't have more than six or seven left, I gotta say, because characters are starting to drop like flies. Uh, this issue primarily focuses on the Kingdom of New Orleans. Does yes. he have a metal mustache and, and uh, crossbar or whatever you call that? Yeah, it's attached to his hat. It's like got two tubes that stick up his nose that uh, are like a breathing apparatus. Okay, that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, he's basically uh, Judge Dredd, but from Texas. <laughs> Um, and he's made it his job to kill all of the chosen, the uh, all pe- one of each person from each of the nations that uh, is their representative in the order that is uh, causing the end of the world in this series. Okay. And so this issue is all about him trying to kill uh, one of the chosen, uh, the man John Freeman, uh, Prince of New Orleans, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I don't want to say where it goes, but uh, no, I do. He wins. All right. Um, there's, it's just solid writing. Like, if you're not following the series up until this point, like, you don't buy this issue. Like, this is a series you read from issue one, so yeah, which I highly recommend everybody does. This looks nothing like the, the issues I read, and I think I read through, like, issue seven. Yeah. This, does, this doesn't even look like the same series. Yeah. Uh, it <laughs> does have some classic writing, though. We get a scene of all the different brothers, all the different princes of New Orleans, uh, sort of bickering with each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, so previously, well, one of the younger brothers has attempted to kill John so that he could take his place as the next crown prince, but John mm-hmm. easily uh, avoided that assassination attempt and shot off his leg. <laughs> and uh, so at the table, John delivers this line uh, about how, let me know if you're having any trouble making your way in the world with that foot. I'm I'm always happy to offer one of my brothers a helping hand. Mm-hmm. And so the brother, he goes, you want to know what my leg is? Take a look. And he slams his fake leg onto the table. <laughs> it's still fake and it still hurts. Can you do anything about that? And John goes, look at this idiot. I offer a helping hand. He asks for a foot. <laughs> Everyone laughs. <laughs> that is pretty good. But the king is not happy about that shit. <laughs> and uh, he has a... Uh, fight with his son and ask him to choose between becoming the next king and officially leading the nation or retaining his allegiance to the crazy religion of the chosen and uh, he makes his choice and uh, yeah makes his choice and it, uh, it ends badly for him alright and uh, we're barreling towards the ending here and I, I, I can't wait it's just been so good every time what is this monthly uh, I think they're getting one out every two or three months right now. Ooh, that's rough. Because, um, yeah, it's definitely been running for many years, and we've had long breaks. It's one of those projects that takes time because it really takes creativity. You can't just pump one out every week. Right, and Nick Dragata has drawn every issue, no fill-ins, and nothing like that, and I would much rather have the delays and have it be uniform all the way throughout than any kind of fill-ins or anything like that. It's never worth it to have fill-ins. Yeah, I agree mm-hmm. All right, guys. So, I kept buying Batman. Should we stop? <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the thing. It's Batman 51. Um, I thought this was actually one of the better issues of Batman for well, this run. Well, yeah, one of the better ones. That, that is fair, but it just hasn't really been a high streak lately. Like, they're not doing great. Yeah, they're very true. Uh, I really don't get the ending. Of this one, well, if I'm being perfectly honest. I'll tell you about it. Okay, so let's, uh, real quick, uh, Mr. Yeah. Freeze is on trial. Yep. Uh, he's been taken in by Batman. Uh, he confessed to Batman that he committed the crime that Batman hunted him down for. Yep. And Bruce Wayne is selected to serve on the jury trial, uh, the jury for the trial. Yep. Uh, during his testimony, Mr. Freeze says that he only said that he was guilty because uh, Batman was so mad when he was beating the shit out of him that he was sure that Batman would kill him if he didn't confess. <laughs> Now, there's only one person in the whole world who could know if that's true or not. 
That's Bruce Wayne. Well, he knows it's true. He's fucked up because of the way his ending didn't ha- uh, wedding didn't happen, and that's why it ended that way. Yeah, uh, but uh, does he not believe that Freeze uh, committed these crimes now, or is he just doing this out of some sense of guilt because he beat Freeze up? <clears throat> I don't know. If in the issue it specifies whether we know if we, I feel like it doesn't specify if he's guilty or not, but he seems to say, think that he isn't, and it, there was no, what we do know is that there was no connection between any of these murders until Batman came in. The police didn't notice any connection, there was no anything except for the cause of death being really rare and specific and happening to have something to do with a cold thing. Right. So, uh, yeah, the fact that... I, I think that he may not know whether or not Freeze is guilty or not, but he does know that he coerced the confession. Right, he definitely knows that. But if, if he doesn't know whether or not... If, if he doubts that Freeze could have done it, sure, I understand the ending. But if he knows that Freeze did it because of this evidence that he gathered, and he just feels bad because he feels like he did it in the wrong way and he's believing in the justice system by doing this I think that's a bad idea I, I, don't, I don't think, think that. Batman I don't think Bruce Wayne thinks that way I think Bruce Wayne would only make this choice if there was the chance that Mr. Freeze was in fact not guilty yes. I think he may have been convinced by Mr. Freeze's case Okay, yeah, so that's fine when I was reading it I thought it was uh, the other way that I said. Well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, that's and true. That made me bat- mad because I felt like that's not the way Bruce Wayne thinks. You yes. would think, yes, he feels bad about this, but he, he, I'm sure he feels bad about a lot of the things he does as Batman. It's not worth it to keep a uh, murderer on the streets. Well, this is going to be a three-issue arc. Okay. So unless it's going to be two more issues of Bruce just like waffling with himself and his general <laughs> thoughts, which it is a Tom from Batman comic, so it could be, it does seem like we're going to get a continuation of one of the other parts of this comic, one of my favorite parts of uh, any Batman comic, and that's when Dick Grayson is in the bat suit. Oh, that's true. Um, and uh, Dick is probably going to be continuing to investigate this. Uh, that would be my guess, is that uh, Dick could actually f- find out uh, whether or not it actually is Freeze within the next couple of issues, and that could... Uh, I affect Bruce's is. decision, but because yeah. Uh, yeah, Bruce could just be stalling for time for Batman to uh, continue the investigation by that's dissenting true. with the rest of the jury. I did not think of that. No, that's, that's definitely true. So, so. Uh, yeah, I thought it was. Th- I thought this was definitely a step up from <laughs> many of the issues of Tom King Batman. It's still mm. not great. I would like a Batman comic with more action. Yeah. Nope. Uh, especially because this isn't Detective Comics. This is Batman. Detective Comics is supposed to be the one that's about detective <laughs> police shit, and Batman is supposed to be the superhero action title. Yeah. I think there's a dearth of superhero action in Batman, and that's a huge problem. But I did think that this issue was not as nearly as cringe as met most of the other issues of this run so far. Agreed. Just in both Batman and Bendis is Superman, my problem is that there's a ratio of picture to words that you should have and they just go overboard on the words. Yeah, they destroy the ratio for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Tom King isn't always like that, but uh, for some reason, yeah, he's, man, for some reason it's this weird philosophical treatise. And and we're going to talk about overly wordy comics more later. (laughs) Um, And also speaking of which, uh, wordy comics, new challengers. Uh, I don't know, this one I might kind of be done with, honestly. It's issue three. Uh, of new challengers. I felt like the last issue was better. This issue didn't really progress us anywhere. It was. I thought it was very confusing to introduce the old challengers that I'm not very familiar with. <laughs> and then immediately <laughs> and then kill, I them guess off. kill them. But like, <laughs> I can't even follow who's like dying and living and people are getting shot and coming back as other people. And uh, the one. Th- okay, so I followed most things except for one thing. The, the 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 professor. There's suddenly two of them, and I do not know where one became two. Yeah, because apparently on the old <laughs> challengers, one of the four generic regular dudes of the challengers is the professor. That's oh. what I was getting from this page. Okay. Because there's that one other panel where he says the only professor I know is the guy standing behind me with the but, spiky hair. Yeah. Right. But there's only like the other challengers who are all young, and I think the, when they say professor, we're looking for some sort of scientisty or uh, quirky looking dude. But yeah, I think it's like this guy. Yeah. Um, um, or this guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, anyway, so that's confusing. I think this is another professor, right? 
Uh, yes, that's what it appears to be. Yeah, so... So it appears to be that there is a good professor and a bad professor, and they have all of the same knowledge in their minds. So the question is, how much do we care about all these mysteries? Also, this did not happen in this comic. Yeah, that, I know. That, that is definitely <laughs> very true. If that happened, it would be a good comic. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh God, yeah. I, I'm okay with passing on this one. I don't care about these characters at all. Um, I do want to mention that... Uh, Hulk 3 did come out this week, but the comic book store's issues were all damaged, so uh, we'll be reviewing that next week or the week after, most likely. And uh, they also sold out of Thor 3, but I... uh, Screw it. That's a good enough reason to not buy any more of that Thor run. Yeah. So finally, um, moving on to Justice League issue 4 by... uh, Not Zack Snyder. Scott Snyder. (laughs) And uh, Jorge Jimenez. Um, I did think this was the best issue so far, based purely on the fact that you could kind of draw a straight line from one end to the other of this oh, issue. It and was very the clear. Plot. Yeah, very, very clear. Um, I don't know if everything that's happening is super interesting. It feels like this maybe is like two or three comics worth of plots that are being slammed into one story right. that maybe should have been, some of these maybe should have been extricated so we could spend a little more time on other things. But hasn't that been the problem since they decided to expand the universe again? Is that they're just giving us so much so fast all the time because, like, there's no limits? So they're trying to make us feel the same fatigue that the heroes are feeling? <laughs> yeah, or the source something all like that. Um, I mean, the art looks great. Yeah. And uh, we got some cool stuff happening. I mean, the turtle, why not? The turtle is cool with Grad there and his evil face. And I guess Luther has some little micro ships that, uh, if you latch onto the right part of somebody's brain, even Superman or the Martian Manhunter's brain, you can just like <laughs> control their personality. Like Joker's just at the controls of a ship, and he plugs in via the jack to Martian Manhunter's brain, and now like Martian Manhunter looks like the Joker. I know <laughs> it's really weird. Which that's. Ripping. Uh, that's like reversing a good old Grant Morrison plot from when Martian Manhunter made himself think like the Joker so that they could escape a crazy prison created by the Joker's mind. Uh, yeah, Because I like what they're doing. They're just doing it in weird ways. And they're doing it in weird ways, and I so don't comprehend so many of the things. That, like, they're telling us that all these things are bad, and they're yeah. doing such a bad job of showing us why any of these things are oh, bad. So, so what happened that made Sinestro suddenly have a huge army? I think that every single person on Earth is now in the Ultraviolet Corps and flying out there. And also many aliens from other parts of the galaxy. Okay. Yeah. Like, that's kind of... Maybe not yeah. every person on Earth, but like, based on the dialogue in the comic, it's a significant chunk of the Earth's population and now is the largest Lantern Corps in history. No, it seems like it's a significant chunk of the universe's population. Right, because it's the planets that Umbrax has been passing by on the way, right? Yeah. Oh no, guys, the Justice League surely ain't gonna be able to deal with this one. This was my, uh, the funniest was this, like, four-pointed Starro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, he looks pretty cool. <laughs> right? Christian Starro. <laughs> well, we need Cross Starro. And we're gonna see what this thing that Luther's looking for is, I guess, next next issue, unless they pull a fast one on us and uh, like do a flashback or something for two issues. That, sir, is an upvote. An upvote? You read it. <laughs> uh, Luther really did figure out something essential about <laughs> mankind. <laughs> oh, no. He's going to use the internet to become president again, isn't he? Don't do it, DC. He can do that whenever he wants. He has been president. Yes, so. exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's that. That's what we have. Will, read us out. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you for stopping by. You should definitely give us a follow on Twitter, which we're going to finally start using this week. Very exciting. Very cool. exciting. Cool. So uh, follow us on Twitter at the underscore lag. That's the underscore L-A-A-G. You can also send us an email at lagentertainment at gmail.com with whatever you'd like to say. Anything is fine, really. Uh, if you just want to listen to us, we're at lagentertainment.libsyn.com and also on a bunch of different uh, podcasting services. We'll probably be on more by the end of the week as well. And uh, we're also on YouTube. Uh, Lagcast on YouTube. Look, Look us up. up. Two A's. Yeah, two A's. Why would we possibly do that? Listen and find out. Thanks, Bye. folks. Bye. Uh...